if you're going to do special music, it needs to be special. And so that was that was special, glorious, 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 the youth team member there. We are we're really privileged tonight to have had the head of ours. I know him as Bobby, but he once he turned 30, he wants to make the transition from Bobby to Robert. <laughs> He's got the same email address as his dad, so every time I email him, I'm emailing his dad, who's a missionary in uh, Accra, Ghana, Africa. And so we really privileged to have them with us. They were uh, the door directors here in our church, 2009, 2010, 2011. They went to Pioneer Church in Houston, Texas, successfully pioneered that. And uh, that church is up and running today. They handed over to the Nolans, Fred and Alicia there, and they're uh, continuing on with that. After that, went on to uh, Pioneer there in North Carolina. And uh, came back to be on staff just uh, about 20 months ago or so here. And he's uh, off on another adventure along with his wife, three kids. And that, that Penske truck is, is it packed to the back door? Almost to the back door. Amen. On an adventure of a lifetime. You get in a Penske truck, you fill it up. You get your Google Maps or your iMaps going, and off you go to a new world and a new place. So excited. Let's give him a welcome as he preaches this morning. Enough space in the back of my truck so I can stick the crossfire uh, song service to them. <laughs> Take them all the way down to Washington. <laughs> Amen. I uh, absolutely love this church. So practically born and raised here. Uh, my parents got saved when I was four years old. A lot of uh, familiar faces, and um, I just absolutely love this church. Pastor probably pretty much had a had a prime me out of here, but uh, we're we're thankful and uh, I appreciate everyone here. And uh, I'll do my thank yous at the end when when they pray for us. Amen. If you have your Bibles, if you can turn with me to the Book of Philippians. Book of Philippians chapter 2 and also the book of Matthew chapter 26. Book of Philippians chapter 2, uh, book of Matthew chapter 26. And um, in my opinion, one of the most interesting characters in the Bible um, that I that I come across is uh, Judas Iscariot. And a uh, man that no doubt had a selfish ambition. He had his own ambitions in life and his own ideas. Uh, selfish ambition can be a dangerous trait this evening. It leads you to believe that you have full control and ultimately leads you, uh, leads you to a life of destruction and a loss of control which results in depression, it can result in anxiety, uh, anger. Neglecting to repent will cause harm to your future. And I want to share an illustration with you this evening. It says, once upon a time two people were stranded on a secluded island. One out of them was arrogant, stubborn, and selfish, while the other was cooperative, assistive, and kind-hearted. The latter used to share all that he would have with the former, including food, water, and shelter, but the same did not hold true to the former. After a month, a rescue team reached the same island, anchored their ship, and went on to search for the two lost men in the island. And after searching for about an hour, they reached the kind-hearted guy's hut. They were pleasantly welcomed by him, and he offered them a coconut water, on which he had been surviving since the past month. The rescue team liked his cooperation and asked him to go to the ship while they would bring the second guy. The kind-hearted guy made his way to the ship, while the rescue team made their way to the stubborn guy, selfish, uh, the selfish guy's hut. They entered the hut, but they were unable to find him. Instead, they saw large piles of coconuts stuffed inside. It was pitch black inside, so they called him out. Instead of answering them, he started to throw stones and pebbles, thinking that they'd come to steal his coconuts. Amen. <laughs> the precious to him. The rescue team tried to pacify him, but continued to hit them as hard as possible. At last, after repeated attacks from the selfish man, and since they were uh, unable to identify him due to the prevailing darkness, one of them took out his rifle and shot him to death. They thought him to be a tribal man, fearing for their lives, and more than all would soon arrive. They ran towards the ship. Upon reaching the ship, the kind man asked him about the whereabouts of his friend, but the rescue team told that they were unable to find him. They later told him about the incident that occurred inside the hut, 
and how they managed to escape from there. The kind man was shocked to listen to this, and by the conditions specified by the rescue team, he was able to make out that the person they killed was none other than his friend. He prayed that his soul would rest in peace, and they departed for their home. So the selfish man in our story, no doubt, was a man that can care less about others, and we can agree. He assumed control over the entire situation. He hoarded all the coconuts to himself. The final result is it led him to death because he was blinded by his own gain. Now I want to make a statement is don't be the product of the slow death of selfish ambition. Selfish ambition or selfish gain will always lead to self-destruction. If you're so consumed with selfish ambition, you're headed down a long, dark road that you feel like you have control over, but you really don't. But if you live a life that is selfless, then you can experience life and freedom, and you can be rescued from your trials in life. The question is, are you living a life of a selfish, ambitious individual, or are you living a life that is selfless, and a life that's lived for God? And let's look at our first text in the book of Philippians, chapter 2, verse 3 through 4. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. And also, let's look in our uh, text in Matthew 26, verse 14. Then one of the twelve, whose name was Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priest and said, What will you give me to deliver him over to you? And they paid him thirty pieces of silver. And from that moment, he sought an opportunity to betray him. And let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you this evening. God, we ask that you speak to every person in this place. God, that you move in our lives, Lord. God, that you expose selfish, ambitious areas in our lives. God, that we can put you first in all decisions that we make. And we thank you and we give you all the glory and all the praise. And everyone says, Amen. Amen. Praise God. There's three things I want to look at, uh, especially here with, uh, with Judas Iscariot. Judas betrayed Jesus for a selfish motive. We know he went to the chief priest. He uh, wanted uh, to do dealings with them. They gave him 30 pieces of silver. And after Judas had done that, he begins to spiral out of control. He begins to lose control over the situation. And the Bible says he goes back and he tries to hand back the 30 pieces of silver. They deny it. They said it's blood money. And after that, he begins to feel guilt. He had remorse, but he did not repent. He felt bad about what he did, but he never repented, and he took his own life. Amen. Selfish motives in our own lives can also come up. You can betray Jesus for a selfish motive, a selfish gain. You can come to a place where you live in regret. You've made decisions. You try to make amends and fix it yourself. How many you know God's the only one that can fix your life for you? Amen. The dangers of selfish ambition is you drown yourself in emotions that will completely submerge, completely submerge you into a dangerous place. But God wants you to come to Him. He'll cast your sins as far as the east is from the west, and He wants you to make decisions with Him first and Him involved. Amen? The first thing I want to look at with you is the selfish motive. So Judas always has selfish motives. You know, in the Bible, uh, they consider Judas a thief. He handled the money back. And uh, he was the, the oddball of the disciples. He handled the money. He wanted control over it. He was upset when the woman poured the perfume on Jesus. He wanted to sell it and supposedly give to the poor. The Bible says he, he was a thief. His decision making was always linked to his own gain. Matthew chapter 26 verse 16. And they paid him 30 pieces of silver. And from that moment he sought an opportunity to betray him, to betray Jesus. So to understand Judas and his decision making, we have to look at who he was. We know Judas was a zealot. I mean, zealots were believed to be a political movement to overthrow Roman government. And back in biblical times, the Jews, they were waiting for a savior. They're waiting for a savior to come. They're, they're probably in their mind waiting for a warrior to set them free from Roman occupation. But what they got was Jesus that could set them free from sin. So here's Judas the Zealot, believed to be part of a political movement. There's another, uh, uh, scholars believe that uh, the, the Greek word of Judas Iscariot is Judas Iscariot, known as Dagger Man. Uh, they would assassinate Jewish sympathizers. But regardless of what, what Ju uh, Judas, uh, Judas Iscariot was, 
He had a motive in his life. He had a selfish motive for turning Jesus in, and I believe it was far greater than just 30 pieces of silver. 30 pieces of silver today is equivalent to about $200. And at the, uh, in, in those times, maybe buy some land. Regardless of his exact motives, we know he was a zealot and followed Jesus for the wrong reasons. Maybe he was hoping for a warrior, but he got a sacrificial lamb, a, a lamb that died upon the cross for our sins. In the end, he made a decision based on his own selfish motives and his own selfish gains for 30 pieces of silver. In your walk this evening, you can be blinded by all that God really wants to do in your life. Can you imagine? Here's Judas. He's following Jesus. He sees the lame walk, the blind see. They're being healed. Miracles taking place. Uh, uh, multitudes being fed. You can come to a point where you have selfish motives and you fail to pursue God's plan and purpose in your own life. In the end, if you're not careful, you can trade in destiny for a small amount, just as Judas did in uh, uh, the, the book of 2 Kings chapter 5, verse 20. You know the story of Gehazi. Gehazi had selfish motives. Gehazi was a servant of Elisha. He saw miracles firsthand. Was able to experience supernatural miracles. Was able to follow a man of God. The story of Naaman. He was told to dip in the Jordan seven times. Naaman was a commander of the army of the king of Aram. He was a valiant warrior, but he had leprosy. And he heard Elisha was nearby. He traveled to Elisha, and at his front door, Elisha doesn't come out. He sends a servant out. And the servant goes out and begins to uh, give him instruction to go and dip in the Jordan seven times. The Bible talks about Naaman, how he was upset, but he ends up doing it, and he's healed. And after he's healed, he wants to give an offering to Elisha. And Elisha turns it down, and here's Gehazi. He thinks within himself, you know what? I don't want him to get away that easy. You know, he shouldn't get away that easy. So he travels and finds Naaman and tells Naaman that, that uh, the prophet, Elisha, changed his mind. He'll take the offering. And what the Bible says is this man, because of his own selfish motives, his own selfish ambitions, he tracks him down. And the Bible says he was struck with leprosy himself. And he walked away as white as snow. Selfish motives will alter destiny of what God wants to do in your life. And can you imagine, here's Elisha. Elisha followed Elijah. He was able to step into destiny and purpose. Now here's Gehazi. I wonder what his life would have been if he would have followed after what God wanted him to do. Be a servant to Elisha. Maybe picking up the mantle and continuing on. Selfish motives can alter destiny of what, of what God wants to do in your life. If you make decisions based on what you can gain in the flesh... You can put a stop on what God wants to do in your personal life. But if you make decisions based on what God wants, you can hold on to purpose and destiny this evening. And what God has planned for you. The question is, are you making decisions based on what you can achieve in the flesh or what you can do for God? Amen. We all have a plan and purpose in life. God has a plan for each and every one of us. Amen. I remember um, when I was a board right to here, it's when uh, Pastor, Pastor Rosario was on staff and I uh, was around 2009, and I remember the economy, you guys remember construction, was like at a halt. I was an electrician and by trade for a few years, and uh, I got a job. I remember at that time, the prayer room was full in the morning. <laughs> a bunch of jobless people were all praying and laying hold God to give me a job. So I was praying, I was like, God help me, you know, and I, I went to an interview, and I got a job. I got a job, and I actually, I just took whatever came to me first. And the job I took, and I was a door director at the time, and I was there for a couple of weeks, and um, I started late, and I didn't get off till 7.30. So I showed up to church late uh, on Wednesday night, and, I, and me and personally, I was convicted. I was convicted, and it was a couple of weeks that had gone by, and uh, God dealt with me about it, because I made a decision, and I, I didn't reference off of my relationship with God and what I was called to do, because I knew if I was out there, I probably would have turned that job down would have turned it down because it would have taken me away from Wednesday night service. So in my own life, I was convicted, and I talked to Pastor Rosario, and uh, I may have shared this in offer. I think I use all my good illustrations from my offer. <laughs> I talked to Pastor Rosario, and I said, hey, you know, I, I want to put my two weeks in. I'm convicted, and I'm praying about it. And he's like, well, have you asked God to change your hours? No, I haven't. <laughs> and so I went to church the next day. This was on a Sunday. And I was sitting in my cubicle. And uh, I hate sitting in cubicles. 
I was sitting in my cubicle praying, and I was like, God, if you don't change my hours, I'll put in my two weeks notice, because I know you're in control. And uh, I prayed, and this is my own personal, my own personal life, my own conviction. And within the next hour, my supervisor walked up to my cubicle, and I was only there for a few weeks. And she said that they have an opening, and usually they go to people who have been there for some time or perform. They have their numbers, and uh, seniority people have been there for a while. But she said, I, I want to ask you to see if you want to change your hours, Monday through Friday from 5 a.m. to 1.30, uh, that same hour. And God was able to come through, but the point I want to get is sometimes we can make decisions, but God can turn it around. God can turn things around in your life. I made a decision, made a, my own self, you know, I, I want to get a job and, and work, and, but I didn't include God. I didn't include God in my decision making. And if you're not careful, you can pull yourself out of the will of God and what God wants to do in your own life. God should be the center of every decision you make in your life this evening. You should be involved in every decision that you make. Don't allow an outward circumstance Force you to rely on your own strength. Don't allow fleshly needs and wants come before God and what He wants to do in your life. When you repent and realign yourself with God, He can control the outcome of your life. Amen. I had to put myself in line with God and what He wanted to do in my life. I felt called to preach, and I made a decision that was, that disregarded that. Amen. God loves you this evening, and He wants you to succeed in His purpose and in His will for your life. Amen. The second thing I want to look at is the loss of control. Uh, here's Judas Iscariot. He saw the results of his actions. So here he is. He, he has his own motives. He turns Jesus in for 30 pieces of silver. And then he begins to see what they do to Jesus. They begin to beat Him. They mock Him. They're parading through the streets. And here's Judas. He sees an innocent man being persecuted, and now he feels bad. His plan didn't turn out the way he had thought. He tried to control the outcome of his decisions. Amen. Because of your actions, it can hurt the innocent. You're going to try to assume control, but it can spiral downhill. And ultimately, you can lose control and begin tra uh, become trapped in your own emotions. Judas be, uh, began to become trapped in his, you know, his own emotions, probably felt guilt, felt shame, depressed, and he took his own life. There's a story I want to share with you about a man that came to my church in Houston. He responded to salvation. Um, he actually didn't get uh, talked to on an outreach. We left a flyer on his truck. And he got the flyer on his truck. He, he read it. He actually went online and found the website to this church and read about disciple making. So he came to church and, and came up to me immediately when he walked in. He said, I read the flyer, and I'm a backslider. I want to live for God. I want to be a part of this church. And um, he came to church. He quickly locked in. He, uh, he was blessed. He was earning a six-figure income. Drove a nice vehicle. He was very giving. And uh, he began to serve God, and over time, he began to, to make some decisions. He came up to me, and he found a girl online. <laughs> if you're here tonight, don't take it online. <laughs> he found a girl online, and he told me, I, you know, I, I met up with her, and I want to know what your thoughts are, and I told him I don't think it's a good idea. And I began to ask him uh, questions, and come to find out she's a drinker, and he's like, and, and his response was, Pastor, it's okay, I have it under control. I have it under control, I'll bring her to church, and if, so flirt, flirt to convert doesn't work. <laughs> So here he is, I got it under control. He actually brought her to church. She came to service. And uh, I think she knew a couple songs. <laughs> and uh, um, he disappeared. He was gone for a couple weeks. And uh, several weeks later, actually a couple, a couple months later, he had called me. And um, he had asked me if I could help him with his truck payment. Come to find out, he strung out on meth. He got in a, a massive fight with her, began to drink heavily with her. He lost his six-figure income, uh, his truck, and everything was stripped from him because he made a decision thinking, I have it under control. I have it under control. A loss of control is a gradual decline that you cannot fix on your own. Here's this man, he's in this position in life. You would think he had a place to go to. He could come to Jesus, right? 
Jesus will forgive you over and over and over again. Amen. He laid, he died on the cross, shed his blood so that you could be forgiven. And here he is. He's at the bottom of the bottom, and he still never repented. He's on the same relationship for the fifth time. I found out he, he, he relapses on drugs. Completely addicted. Com he tried to fix the situation on his own. Judas Iscariot, he tried to go back to the chief priest and give back the 30 pieces of silver. Trying to make amends. They denied the money. They said, that's blood money. We don't want that here. Here's Judas trying to fix it. We can't fix it on our own. We have to rely on, on the doctor up in heaven. He can fix us this evening. If you fail to give God control and repent, then you can lose control over your life and over your situation. But if you come to Jesus for your mistakes, your wrongdoings, you've messed up, then God can restore the life that you lost control of and place you back into destiny and purpose. I made a de uh, decision in my life taking this job, but God was able to turn things around and work a miracle. Are you relying on your own strength to make amends? Or are you coming to Jesus this evening? Do you trust in God for your circumstances? People tend to lose control of their lives because they lack the faith to put their trust in God, knowing that he's in control. Can you imagine Judas? And I, I try to place myself in his shoes. You're following Jesus. You're seeing miracles take place. The love, the lame walk, the blind see, and all these things happening, and he still lacked faith in the one he followed. We have to understand that God is always in control, and he's able to move on your behalf, and he's able to help you in your life when your life feels like it's starting to spiral out of control. And Romans, uh, chapter eight. Romans chapter 8, verse 28, And we know that all things come together for the good, for those that love God and are called according to his purpose. Those that love God do his will, not their own. It, it is God first. If you trust God, you know that he's in control. Regardless of the situation that you're in, you will have peace of mind knowing that God will guide and direct you if you put him first. In this decision I made for this job, God was in control. God was able to orchestrate some things in my life. When things seem to be in chaos, messed up, or maybe you've made some mistakes, if you come to Jesus this evening, he will give you peace knowing that you can make it through. You know what, God, God's able to help you and you're able to make it through. The last thing I want to look at is uh, remorse but no repentance. Judas Iscariot felt bad about what he did. He wanted to give back the 30 pieces of silver. He tried to return it, maybe receive some closure, some release. But he could not find the answer himself, which resulted in him committing suicide in the end. And he probably felt an overwhelming amount of guilt, an overwhelming amount of shame. You're here tonight, you can feel bad about things you've done. Maybe you're a visitor, a new convert. Maybe you feel ashamed about things in the past. You feel remorse. Having guilt doesn't save you. It, it, it allows you to build a deeper and deeper hole that you, you begin to feel more and more trapped in. Judas dug a trap in his life. Jesus died on the cross for him. I wonder what would happen if Judas repented. What would he have done for God? You could feel bad, feel ashamed. The problem with having remorse and not repenting is it brings you to a place where you become addicted to your emotions and you give up on yourself. And people get addicted to emotions. Depression nowadays is huge, especially with young people. Uh, I'll share a story. I was, uh, was when Pastor Tozer did his uh, first, this first year he did the Hell House. You guys, you guys remember Hell House? I think it was a riot. <laughs> I remember handing out flyers, we were going everywhere. We were going to Tempe, we were Mesa, high school, we were all over the place handing out flyers. And I remember I was in Tempe, and we were handing out flyers, and I handed a flyer to a man that just looked distraught. It was in the evening time, he was going to the store with his wife and, and his, uh, his child. And as I handed him the flyer, he just stopped and began to talk with me, and uh, began to share with me about what he was going through, and you know, being the witness to him. And um, he had told me his experience earlier that day. He was driving home from work, and uh, he was trying to get home, and uh, he saw a light turn yellow. And we all know a yellow light means slow down. And um, he uh, put his foot on the gas. He said he blew through the light. It actually was red when he went through the light. 
and a vehicle was making a left-hand turn, and he T-bones the car with seven people in it. None of them were in seatbelts, and three children stepped into eternity. Three, three children died from that accident. And here he is later that night, he has an overwhelming amount of guilt in his life. No doubt it's a super tragic story, and, uh, but an overwhelming amount of guilt. He said he has depression. He said that night he has, he's been having thoughts of suicide. And it's just an overwhelming amount of guilt on his life. And I began to talk with him, and I ended up praying with him. I ended up praying with him and prayed for him. And uh, after I had done that, I don't know the results of what happened with him uh, later on in life. But after I prayed with him, he said he felt better. And felt like a, a weight was lifted off. But you're here tonight. If you feel an overwhelming amount of guilt, maybe an overwhelming amount of shame, God's here to lift that from you. We're not called to carry that. If you feel bad about things that you may have done, maybe you blame yourself for things that were out of your control, but you never laid it down for God to take the burden from you. You begin on a spiral downhill if you don't give it to God. But if you cast your cares on Him, God in heaven can reach down and pull you out of the miry clay. The question is, have you come to Jesus with your guilt this evening? Have you come to Christ with your remorse? Don't be like Judas. He didn't come to Christ. He began to be addicted to his emotions, and he took his own life. King David was exposed and felt overwhelming guilt in the Bible. He committed adultery. He committed murder. He deceived. And here he is, he's exposed by the prophet. He felt remorse. He felt bad. But the difference is David repented. He gave it to God in the book of Psalms 51, 10 through 19. We all know the song, created me a clean heart, O God. He repents in Psalms 40, verse 2. He also brought me out of the horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet upon a rock and established my steps. You're here tonight. When you repent, He's able to pull you out of the pits of life. When you repent this evening, you're able to be pulled out of the miry clay. You're no longer stuck in life. You're no longer stuck spiritually. You no longer have the weight of guilt upon your life. Jesus shed His blood so He can take that away from you. When you repent this evening, you have a new foundation on the rock, which is Christ Jesus. Don't be a Judas. Be like David. Be like Peter. He denied Christ. The Bible says he preached and thousands got saved. He was able to be used. He had his own uh, uh, testimony in his life. He gave his life back to Christ. He repented, and God was able to use him. God's able to use you tonight. doesn't matter what you've done or what you've gone through, the difficulties that you're involved or what life is thrown at you. If you repent and give your guilt to God, he's able to take that from you and place you back in purpose and destiny in your life, and he's able to help you and move in your life and give you purpose and destiny. You're here tonight. Maybe, maybe you've served God for some time, and God's dealing with you about some things. You know, uh, selfish ambitions can come in all different forms. Coming to an opportunity for a job or a, a place to live, moving, and all different things that are happening. Uh, we can put God first with all decisions that are made, and God's able to help you, and He's able to move in your life. Amen. And uh, if you put Him first, He's able to uh, give you purpose and destiny. Amen. If we can all every, every head down and every back closed just for a few moments. The slow death of selfish ambition. Maybe you're here tonight. It's not bad to have ambition, but it has to be geared to the right thing. You're here this evening. Maybe you're not saved. You're not born again. You never accepted Jesus Christ into your life. The Bible says if you repent, confess with your, uh, confess with your mouth, believe in your heart, the Lord Jesus rose from the dead, you shall be saved. For the mouth confession is made unto salvation. I was raised in church. I prayed all my life. But what made a difference in my life is I said a prayer and I began to live the life that God wanted me to live. And you're here this evening. Maybe you're not saved, but you want to experience salvation this evening. Maybe you have guilt. You have shame. We've all sinned. We've all done things wrong. But God's able to set you free tonight. And you want to experience this salvation. You can experience this free gift with an uplifted hand. Say, you know what? That's me. I'm not saved. I'm not born again. I want to experience salvation in my life. I want to be set free from sin. With an uplifted hand, while no one's looking around, just raise up your hand and say, you know what, that's me. I see this hand. God bless you. Anybody else? 
If you just raise up your hand, you're not saved, you're not born again. You want to give Jesus a chance in your life. Maybe you're backslidden. You once served God. Maybe things begin to creep up in your life. You made some decisions and you turned away from God. The Bible says He's willing to welcome you back home with open arms. Like the prodigal son, He welcomed his, his son home with open arms. After He squandered everything He gave Him. And you're here. God wants to welcome you back home. You're back sitting with an uplifted hand, so you know that's me. You're not saying back I see this hand, God bless you. Anybody else? You're back and you want to rededicate your life to Christ. You can just raise your hand up all across this place. Amen. If you raise your hand, we can do one more thing, but you guys can stand to your feet. Amen. Come to the salt of someone's going to pray with you. You're here this evening. Maybe God's dealt with you in your life about certain areas. Maybe certain, certain decision making. And God's exposed some things in your life. I think God for an altar. We can do business with God at an altar. Man, we can all stand in this place. Maybe God's dealt with you. These altars are open. Feel free to come down and hold it. God, we glorify you, Lord. We exalt your name. Oh,
all stand you can return to your seats. Amen. We're going to pray for the header guards of Vanessa to come. Kids, first Lily, Lily. So I'll ask the uh, council members that are here, Tom and Steve would come, Pastor Yokota would come, want to pray for the header guards. Again, they're going to be in that next truck tomorrow. Traveling the mercies. Actually, they're not in the Pensacola truck tomorrow. They're driving their car, and uh, we have some help coming to drive for the Israel. We'll be driving the uh, truck himself up to Canada, Washington. So we're going to pray for them and believe God that God would prosper them. Uh, this couple means a lot to my wife and I. They've been a great blessing uh, to us, the entire church staff, and. Um, We've been really thrilled to have them here. Pastor Campbell's uh, once again in the Midwest tonight, so we get to pray for them this evening. And I have to believe God. There's some specific things we want to pray for tonight. I want to pray, of course, for traveling mercies, getting from point A to point B, that God would immediately give them a great place to live. A job, our pastors go out and they work, we'll give them a month's salary right up front so you can at least have the time to find a job that God would open a great door for a job, and as well for a place to hold church. They are right on kind of the eastern portion of Washington, right on the Columbia River there, and so uh, it's going to be a great, great opportunity for our church up on the Pacific Northwest. How many knows the Pacific Northwest really needs Jesus Christ? And so we're going to believe God for them for all of these things tonight. And I'm going to have... Uh, Vanessa, testify, share a little bit about what you want to tell the congregation. Um, first off, I want to give God all the praise and glory, because without Him, I wouldn't be here. Um, a little bit about my testimony is that I grew up in a broken home. I lost my mom at a very young age, and um, my dad was uh, an abusive alcoholic. So when I grew up, I had this emptiness in my heart that I tried to fill with the things of the world and I just kept coming up empty and I, wouldn't, I wasn't able to be filled until the day that I gave my life to God right here. I bowed my knee and I just did such a simple prayer that changed my life forever. And that was at the age of 17 years old and I am 31 years old now. And so... <laughs> and, um, Growing up in a broken home, I felt like I was worthless. And so when I did give my life to God, He showed me that my life is not worthless. And the fact that He entrusts me to even be, uh, to be able to be the mother that I didn't get to have growing up, to my kids and a wife, and to be even able to go out there and start another church is such a privilege. And no matter, I want to let you know that no matter what, what kind of life you grew up um, living or what you've done in your past, that it does not matter, that God can use you for everything because there, I cannot believe that he's even willing to use us once again. And I want to say thank you for everybody for opening up their hearts and um, being so nice to me and my family. It made me feel very special and um, especially the staff and, um, and, the, and the teens. They, um, they have a very big part of my heart and I cannot wait to see what they have for the future of their lives. I want to say my thank yous for the end because I want to take up my sermon time. <laughs> I just want to say thank you uh, to this congregation and I want to thank the staff, Pastor Tozer, Pastor Bill Coda. Uh, they've been a, a huge blessing in my life. Just, uh, I like to observe and watch, and I learned a lot uh, being here. And I want to thank Pastor Campbell, his wife, Connie. And uh, I have a lot of friends here, and I start naming names, and I forget someone I might lose some friends. <laughs> so I want to do that. But I, I really appreciate this church and, uh, and uh, the relationship. I want to thank Jason Johnson and his wife, Blanca. They've been a huge blessing. Um, we were uh, over the teams together. And I had a, I had a great time with the teens. Uh, the teens they made me, made me feel a little bit a little bit younger. I had to lose weight so I could keep up with them. <laughs> but I, I appreciate this church and, and I pray for us. Amen. Let's go ahead and stand
seated. You stretch your hands out. We're going to pray for this couple. We are going to ordain them for kingdom business, kingdom purpose, kingdom success, and that God would prosper everything they put their hands to and do a quick work in Kenway, Washington. Let's go ahead and, and pray to my Father. Praise be to God. Let's give God praise to God. 